super low energy houses might appear as experimental concepts, but they're rapidly becoming mainstream for all new buildings throughout Europe. The challenge now is to use innovative technologies to bring the performance of all our existing buildings up close to this standard. In this EcoEye special, we'll be travelling to Austria to see how innovation in cutting-edge smart homes is at the heart of a European building revolution. And back in Ireland, we show you how to avoid getting left out in the cold. With a reputation for efficiency, you'd expect the Austrians to take issues like energy saving seriously. Well, they don't. They take it really seriously. By 2020, they plan to energy upgrade all buildings built between 1950 and 1980. Three quarters of Austrian buildings are residential homes. Most urban dwellers live in three to five storey apartment buildings. Many rural areas are dominated by cluster villages nestled in valleys are farmhouses that have been in the family for hundreds of years. They're a landlocked country, mostly covered by alpine mountains, and as such are dependent on expensive imported fossil fuels. So there's a lot we can learn here. Irish homes have some of the poorest energy performances in Europe. An estimated one quarter of Irish households now live in fuel poverty, which means they would need to spend more than 10% of their disposable income on heating. Plus, the fuels we use are set to rise significantly. They're imported at a massive cost of over 2 billion just to heat our buildings. If we spent this money upgrading our building stock, it would have a multiplier effect, recirculating through the economy in the direct and indirect jobs created. Currently, it's simply lost to foreign countries buying oil, coal and gas. The bill for retrofitting all our homes will be big, but by 2020, we'll have spent about 20 billion euro on imported home heating fuels. And if we don't upgrade, by 2050, we could spend over 100 billion euro. When it comes to environmental challenges like climate change, currently, there's no way of meeting our carbon reduction targets without tackling the problems in our housing stock. Austria has taken a ground-up approach to this problem, with communities really getting behind energy-saving measures and striking out for energy independence. Governments here have been working for decades on solving this problem, with new technologies now reaching the markets. I decided to start at the top and work my way down. I'm here in one of the most magnificent scenes here in Austria, I'm up on the top of Dubrach Mountain, which is a national park in Carinthia, high up in the Alps, overlooking the most spectacular of scenery you could imagine. When the community of walkers wanted to replace their existing building with a new one, their architect knew that he had to build to very exacting standards to match the extraordinary conditions of this site down here. Gunther, we're up here in these mountains in the Alps. What's happening in this building? We designed this building for the Alpine community here in Villach. It's a building which has uh, nearly 400 square meters. It's a three-level building. It's built in Passive House standard. It is a wooden building. It has a wooden construction. So this is quite an extreme climate now to build at. What's it like here in the winter? We have measured here at the top wind uh, value of nearly 150 kilometers per hour. And uh, in winter we have here uh, five, six meters snow. And how cold can it get? Last year we have measured minus 24 degrees Celsius. So it could even get colder than that sometimes? The feeling is colder because when you have wind and minus 20 degrees, you feel like minus 40 degrees. But when you, when you have uh, 50 or 30 persons inside the building, you don't need to heat anything because we have in winter the problem here that it's too hot inside the building. The concept of passive house design is to create ultra-low energy demand. If Gunther's passive house design can work in these conditions, it can work anywhere. 
How much insulation is uh, in that? 60 centimeters insulation. Recy 60. Re recycled newspaper is, we call it the cellulose. Two feet, yes. six, 60 centimeters. 60 centimeters. So why did the community of walkers here decide to build a passive house standard? Because energy is here at the top of the mountain very, it's not cheap. Why, as you as an architect, are building to passive house standards? I must use the resources which we have. I can't say, okay, it doesn't matter how many energy we use, how many electricity we use. We must build uh, buildings for the future and for our ch children. And therefore, is the future the passive house because this is a, a building system or a housing system which needs so low energy that it's future-proof. When you build a passive house, does the climate matter? In other words, here's a very extreme. Yes. Austria is a different climate. Sweden is different again. Spain is different again. And Ireland will be quite mild. But can you design passive for all of these different climates? I think you can, but you must look weather conditions at the building site, because a passive house needs sun, sun in the winter. So Gunther, you must be very pleased with your building. What are you most proud about? In this 10 months, we construct and we built the building, and this on a high of uh, sea level of 2,140 square meters. And also I am very proud because, as you see it here, we have now in the last eight months, nine months, there are, we are nearly 50 to 60,000 people here, and they are enjoying the building and have a nice time here, and therefore I am, as an architect, very, very proud. Hervik Ronecker is an architect who has recently restored and energy retrofitted his traditional alpine timber house. He has fitted huge amounts of experimental insulation with vapour resistant qualities and has re-roofed the entire building. The Austrian government has partly funded his work to create high performance building materials and methods as they recognise energy efficiency as a priority for the future. So it's to passive house standards, is it? Yes, only house. So only if only you house. take this house before you insulated it, before you did any of this work, how much would it cost to heat this house for a year? Maybe 3,000 euros. 3,000, okay. A year, so we need 10% of this maybe. So we only 300 euros now. So it's a huge yes. difference. The modern timber extension accommodates a large array of south-facing solar collectors. The building is now 100% self-sufficient with excess energy sold to the local utility. How are you going to use this now? What uses are you going to put this to? Here we are in one of the flats. There are three flats which I will rent for holidays for people who come here and can also learn how to build in an ecological way and how to build with wood, how to build with stone and so on. So will a house like this now last for hundreds of years? It's very important to protect houses with big overhanging roofs and it's very serious for us to put into these things in this design from the beginning on. Then a house can get really old. So over the life of this house, do you think your investment into this has been worthwhile? Yes, I think so. It did not cost more than a new building, so I think it was worth investment. On the edge of Lake Vicency, where the water is crystal clear and clean enough to drink, another striking experimental building is being tested in extreme conditions. This home floats and rotates and tracks the sun to make maximum advantage of free solar heating. Why do you want this house to float? One of the main principles of Passive House is to get the maximum solar gain. So because it floats in the water, you can actually track the movement of the sun and because of that you maximize the solar gain throughout the day and this is the idea behind this concept. One main reason we wanted to prove with this project is that you can build a full building out of timber. So the whole part underwater is also made of timber and in the future you could also use that to be a basement somewhere on the land. Right, and is this the first time now that there has been a basement designed out of timber? This is the first time in the entire world that this is built. Compared to the summer and the winter, which way would it be turned typically? In winter, typically you would turn it towards the sun. Because if the sun is standing lower, it would have more intake into the house and maximize the solar intake again. In summer, you would actually turn it 
away from the sun, so it's actually shaded and doesn't have south, uh, the, the glass facing towards the south. So would it use much energy when you are tracking the sun and moving and rotating like this? Actually, not at all. You could, in theory, move it by hand. What we have used with this house is actually a little motor that turns it timed throughout the day following the sun path. So quite you don't have to do anything yourself. But. So it's quite slowly and it's quite smooth and all of it that. Is, yeah. Yes, very slow, very smooth. But as I said, you wouldn't even need a motor. If you want, you can just exercise yourself every day and turn it with the hands. Passive House is particular designed to actually house or hold the temperature at a constant level of around 20, 22 degrees because of its large or vast amount of, of uh, insulation that it holds inside its wall build-up. So how much insulation has it got on its walls and its roof? Um, we typically use around 400 mil of insulation, which is the same build-up on the floor, the roof and also the bottom. That's a huge amount, like 16 inches and 400 millimetres, a lot of insulation. What about the glazing? In Austria, our standard glazing we use nowadays is triple glazing. And because we fill it with uh, argon or krypton gases, it can reach, a, again, a U-value of 0.5. The basement has underwater views and is made from timber rather than concrete, a much more sustainable building material that minimizes the building's overall carbon footprint. This house also reduces its environmental impact by completely treating its own wastewater. But its heating is where it really scores. So our typical houses in Ireland, people spend about two and a half thousand euros a year in heating and electricity. How much energy would this house consume? Because it's insulated very well and it has a heat recovery inside, you only need about 250 euros per year to spend to keep it warm. And that's for hot water and for space that's heating? for hot water and space heating. That's incredibly good. That's like 10, 12 times better than our average house in Ireland. And, and that's why it always pays off to build to that standard. Ireland has a climate change challenge with the rest of Europe to reduce emissions by 90% by 2050. This means all of our building stock will need massive upgrading. From where we're now, it seems like a daunting environmental and social challenge, but it's also an opportunity for the building industry as it could create over 25,000 jobs in deep insulation retrofits and switching to renewable fuels. To examine the energy issues facing us all, I sent an energy expert team to a typical house in the Dublin mountains. I joined homeowner Donald Flanagan. Good to see you, Duncan. So, Donald, have the energy team arrived here yet? Yes, Archie and Dave are here this morning and they've been busy working around the house. Very good. So, this is your living room? That's right. Open plan, you've dining over this area, fireplace? Yeah, loads of space, great views you can see, right. so it's, it's a wonderful place. Last winter now was, was tough, like coming in and seeing ice on the inside of the windows. You can have the heating on for as long as you want, really, and it still doesn't heat up that much. Looking around Donald's home with the assessors, the root causes of the cold soon became obvious. As we look down the hall then, we can see particular spots just there that are very badly insulated. The house was built at a time when fossil fuel was cheap, and as a result, there was almost no insulation fitted. Thermal imaging showed up cold areas throughout the house. I asked Archie for a breakdown of what was going wrong. So how's this house performing, Archie? This house is typical of Irish detached houses. If you wanted to heat this house to comfort levels, it would cost uh, approximately 8,000. Now, nobody's 8, going to do that. 8,000 euros a year? That's, impos that's impossible. Even today, even though the heat has been on for the last four hours this morning, the, the house hasn't risen above about 15 or 16 degrees. Archie's camera reveals that this house is like most, built in its time, drafty, with almost no insulation. In a cold winter, Donald could leave his boiler on all day and not achieve any level of comfort. So Archie, what are the costs now in upgrading this house to such a good standard, say bringing the energy band down to say a quarter of what it is, and does it make sense to do that? Well, you could reduce the energy cost of this building to, say, a quarter of its, uh, of its current use, um, and that would probably cost you um, somewhere in the region of about 10,000. We would be recommending that the, the homeowner would also look at bringing it down to maybe one-eighth of uh, its current running costs 
and uh, that would involve a lot more work but it makes absolute sense to do that. Energy prices are rising quite steeply, they've doubled in the last three years but the costs of, of labour and materials are still quite, quite low. There's also a grant system there to help with that. So we would encourage people to, uh, to, to go ahead and, and do this work now because if they put it off a few years they've already spent that, that uh, sum on energy which could have gone into um, making the, the, the upgrade to the house and they would miss the benefit of having a few years of, of, of comfort. Houses with low energy ratings like this one are worth bringing up to standard as the work done is paid for over time with energy savings. Grant schemes have started the ball rolling, but we need to find ways to pay for deeper retrofits. Global fossil fuel prices are predicted to continue to rise, but with incomes reducing, it's now a difficult time to be tackling the problem. I talked to Brian Motherway. Well, the typical upgrade for somebody in their home might be to spend maybe three, three and a half thousand euros, especially for an old home where, where it's not in good condition. That might save you one third off your bill, so it pays for itself quite quickly. What's the potential for much deeper retrofits in our homes? We're still at the tip of the iceberg. We have 100,000 homes upgraded in the last two years, but really we'd like to see a million homes upgraded. There's an awful lot more work to do, and we'd like to see people doing deeper retrofits where they really maybe reduce their bills by two-thirds instead of one-third. That's possible, but it costs more, and then the key question then is how do people afford to do that? So how much would it cost to bring it to, say, one-third of its energy? Homes are very different. They're small, they're big, they're old, they're new. But I would think maybe typically you might be talking 15,000 euros, 20,000 euros for the, for the perfect upgrade to really get squeeze out all the efficiency you can out of a home. And again, that will pay for itself, but it might take maybe 10, 15 years to pay for itself. So people have to find ways where, how can I invest in my home now and I will make that money back over the long term. With money so tight today, how can people now kind of find that investment? Well, the key is to find new ways of financing these upgrades, and that's about bringing in the energy companies and bringing in the banks. So the point is, there's money out there still for good investments. See, if somebody said to you, can I invest money and I get a guaranteed 7, 8, 9% return for the next 15 years, that's still a, a strong financial proposition. And that's what we're talking about in homes. So the key is to find ways that people don't have to have the money in their own bank account. They don't have to be able to afford all the upfront payment themselves. There has to be new ways through either who you buy your energy from, maybe a bank, maybe a national scheme, to do what we call pay as you save. So ultimately, the energy savings you're making pay for the upfront investment, and over the lifetime of the project, you get it for free. So 15, 20,000, that's a lot of money for householders today. How do you think they're going to find that money? Well, I think what's interesting is people are starting to realise, although it costs money up front, you actually get that money back. So over the 10, 15 years those investments are in your home, you actually end up making money because your energy bills have been lowered by maybe up to two thirds every year for 15 years. So that makes it a much more interesting thing. How can I invest in my home in a way that actually pays for itself? I get the comfort benefits, I create local employment, I reduce my emissions and I actually make a profit at the end of it. And that's where the financial institutions come in. Banks are saying, well, look, if I can invest, if I can find a way to lend people that money and I know they're going to be able to pay me back because they're saving money, their bills have gone down. And that's what's happening in other countries and that's what we want to do here in Ireland is find ways to offer the typical home an easy way to get the money to upgrade the home. As we explore the options to upgrade our housing stock, we have to be aware that many people are not able to pay for the changes. Rising heating costs badly affect 400,000 households in Ireland now in fuel poverty. I met Charlie Rorty from Energy Action. Well, fuel poverty is the inability to heat one's home due to poor insulated housing, due to low income and also due to high fuel prices. So is the number of householders falling into the fuel poverty net increasing every year? The figure is certainly increasing and it's due to a number of factors including the recession, people losing their jobs. Also, allowances being reduced and more levies on fuel. So typically, what sort of houses are these people living in? Well, the houses in Ireland were very poorly insulated. So people, especially in rural Ireland, are living in cold, wet, damp houses are suffering from cold-related illnesses, etc. And also young families, they are also beginning to feel it because of the recession and also because of lack of income. So what's the work that Energy Action are doing about this? Energy Action are insulating the homes of uh, 
older people and needy people, uh, people who qualify under the fuel allowance criteria, and they are also uh, to doing that. They, what they are doing is uh, at insulation, doing uh, draft stripping, fitting energy light bulbs, and fitting lagging jackets, and also giving energy advice as regards how to read their 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 bills, their energy bills, and also how to read their meter if they have central heating. And some of these people don't have central heating also. How much insulation would you put into a typical attic? The typical insulation nowadays is, is 200 mils that we would have to put into all attics as part of the warmer home scheme. And uh, all the pipes would be lagged, uh, the cold water jackets would be lagged, and tanks and uh, covers put on them as well. Energy Action insulates homes and offers energy advice to vulnerable households. Today, they're upgrading a home in Dublin. These very basic upgrades have a very quick payback for anyone who can afford them. And rather than spending hundreds of millions of euro on fuel allowances each year, we should be focusing this money on upgrading these buildings for the future. Irish homes have over twice the fossil fuel demand of European homes. The cost of retrofitting makes sense when you consider one average home here could easily accumulate heating costs of 50 to 100,000 euros over the next 25 years. I asked Joe Curtin to explain how we get a pay-as-you-save scheme up and running. Well, at the moment, householders are very, very focused on investments with really short paybacks. So what we need to do is we need to find ways to encourage them to make longer paybacks. And I have to say, in fairness to government, they're on the right track. They're looking at this pay-as-you-save option, which does seem to offer a lot of benefits as far as consumers are concerned. But the question is, can we really get inside consumers' heads? Can we convince them that this is a really new option, that they're going to come away from this with a warmer, healthier home, with lower energy bills, and it's not going to actually cost them anything in terms of the repayment, because the repayment is going to come out of their energy savings. And that's a real challenge, to sell this as a completely new option, which is going to have all sorts of benefits for Ireland. So how do we get householders to go with this? Well, I think... People are very used to spending 15 or 20,000 euro on a car, so there's a real communications challenge here to make this normal, to make this socially acceptable. Because as we know, spending 15 or 20,000 euro on a retrofit is an investment which is going to keep on delivering. It's going to keep on delivering energy savings over a 20, 25, 30 year period. And as energy prices rise, this is going to become a more and more valuable investment in the future. A neutral cost on bills may be a big incentive, but it's not the only reason to start retrofitting our homes. Upgrading will increase comfort levels that we've never had before and will last for the lifetime of the home. The home's improved BER rating will increase the potential resale value. And with fuel prices only going up, the only way to really protect ourselves is to literally insulate ourselves from the problem. The money we spend on importing fossil fuels is colossal. If we were able to spend that money here instead, we'd be saving money ourselves, reducing our emissions, and generating jobs in our local communities. But we need new thinking and clear strategies if we're to make the most of the opportunities coming our way. In a later programme, we'll go back to Austria. We'll visit Kutchuk to find out how one small town is making the transition to low energy living and locally generating over three times their own energy needs. We'll also visit a pilot scheme in Tralee, where a district heating project is fuelled exclusively by local forestry. And we'll be dropping into Bolton Glass in Wicklow to meet people who are striking out for their own energy independence. See you then.